you have joined us here this morning to worship the King of Kings. Would you stand with us all over the building? Hallelujah. Come on, are y'all ready to worship him today? Amen. Come on, put your hands together. Wandering into the night a place to hide this weary soul
Savior because you heal my heart you change my name forever free I'm not the same I thank the master I thank the Savior I thank God come on give Jesus praise this morning Amen. You can be seated. Please watch our screen. Welcome to Bayou Blue Assembly. I am so happy that you decided to join us today as we worship together. While you're here, I wanted to tell you about some things we have coming up. Today is the deadline to order your book for our Women's Summer Bible Study on the book of Ruth. God has been doing some really great things in their studies. They have been learning, growing together, and even seeing salvations. If you want to get involved, they meet Tuesdays at 11 a.m. or during our midweek service. Refined, our marriage ministry, is also starting a new Bible study. It's so important to learn God's Word together as a couple, and this next study is going to be really good. Let's watch a quick promo on this now. The people of God have been in captivity. It's been years. Jerusalem's wall has been broken down and its gates have been burned. The condition of the city was a reflection of the condition of God's people. This is what Israel has lacked, faithfulness. Israel ultimately was supposed to be a light to the world that was supposed to be an outpost of God's heavenly kingdom on earth. When you don't recognize the impact of your sin you don't really have a sense of full repentance, but repentance means to change your mind and agree with God about what sin looks like and embrace his way of what a new way of life looks like. Listen, when you're focused on God's intentions, when you're focused on God's values, and when you're focused on God's direction, no matter what the enemy throws your way, you're able to overcome it. The wall is really a tool that helps build the stability of Israel to be a light to the nations. And so now, because Jesus is the one who gives us the ability to shine his light, not through a building made with hands, but a building that's been transformed by the gospel of Jesus Christ and by the blood of Christ. I pray that we as believers, for us to represent him to the world as being the lights that God called us to be, a royal priesthood for his name. Now, let's talk about our 100 year anniversary coming up. We are gathering photos from our church history. So if you have any photos from church over the years, there's a place in our app that you can go and upload to share with everyone during our celebration. And some more super exciting news, we have officially launched our 100 year anniversary shirt and they are available to order through our app today. Download the app and order yours now. For our seniors graduating high school, we want to be able to celebrate you during our senior spotlight at our Sunday night service on May 26th. If you're graduating high school this year, go into our church app and fill out the information for us. Later this month, we are going to be having a church work day. This is a time for us to hang out together, but it's also an opportunity to invest back in your church home and help us to keep the house of God in the best shape possible. We are also providing lunch for those that come the day of and we want to be able to sit down and eat together. So, if you're able, we'd love for you to join us April 20th at 8 a.m. I also want to invite you back here tonight at 6 p.m. as we have our fine arts service. Our youth did great this weekend at fine arts and they showed their hard work that they poured out into their giftings and we want to be able to celebrate them together as a church tonight. Once again, thank you for being here at Bayou Blue Assembly. And now we have one final announcement from our pastor. Hey everybody, I'm Pastor Packy, the lead pastor here at Bayou Blue Assembly. And I am so excited for everything going on at our church. As we prepare for our 100th year anniversary service, this is a significant time for our church and our community as we celebrate everything we've been through. The people that have been a part and preparing for what comes next. Janet and I have had the privilege of pastoring here for the last 31 years. And I remember during the 75th anniversary, we had bought the land that we're currently at here on Prospect Boulevard. And we were thinking about how amazing it would be if God would allow us to still be here for the 100th year celebration because there is so much history that goes into our church and there is so much history yet to be made. 
Back then, it felt like all the work was ahead of us. And now, here we are. This is the year of Jubilee, a year of restoration and freedom, a year of reaping what has been sown. That being said, we want to invite all of you to come and be a part of this celebration. On Sunday, May 19th, we will be having our service at Barry P. Bonville Civic Center here in Homa at 10 a.m. After the service, we're coming back to Bayou Blue Assembly for the celebration. We are gonna provide food for everyone who comes. There will be plenty of fun activities for the kids, and we will walk through different parts of the building as we go through the past, the present, and future of our church. Again, there are so many people that have been involved in our church's history over the years, and as members of our community, we have played a vital role. So mark your calendars, May 19th at 10 a.m. I can't wait to celebrate together for all God has done, is doing, and will do. God bless you. Amen. It's so exciting as we get together for this celebration service. Make sure you invite your family and your friends and anyone that you may know maybe moved away and they don't come here anymore, invite them, tell them to, tell them about it because it's going to be a great, great time. And don't forget tonight's service. Let me tell you, yes, we do need to give offering your tithe and offering if you want to give online or you can give uh, right there in the back today. Give your tithe and your offering. But tonight... Tonight, you don't want to miss, our young people are some of the most creative, amazing young people in the whole world. Um, they give their giftings and their talents to Jesus. And tonight, you're going to be able to see what God is doing in their life. And we, as an uh, older generation, are to, to help them, to spur them on, to encourage them to do it. Because they're the one that's going to carry the gospel next, Right? And we want to train them and disciple them. And that's what part of this is about. And for us, we need to encourage them. I, I tell them all the time, when I get old enough not to do this anymore, I'm going to be on that front row with my cane, Jeremy, with my cane going, yeah, I'm going to have a cool cane too, just so you know. And <laughs> I'm going to be cheering them on saying, yes, sing that sister, preach that, preach that, you know. So that's what we're to do. So you're going to be blessed tonight. If you come, you're going to cry. You're going to laugh. You're going to say, wow, how did they do that? Wow, what in the... Ma there are, they are just some amazing, gifted students that we want to disciple and develop for Jesus so that they can carry the gospel to this next generation, right? So we want you to come back tonight at 6 o'clock and enjoy our youth. Now, right now, t stand up, turn around, greet someone this morning. Hug somebody's neck as, as we continue on.
sing uh we've sang it once before but it's kind of a new song i don't know if we sang it on a sunday morning or during revival or when we sang it but it's called jubilee as you know we are in our year of jubilee i'm excited to to uh have this and have this song called jubilee that just came out and it talks about the spirit of the lord is upon me and pastor's going to be preaching the message about jubilee and what it truly means and this verse was talking about jesus but you know, now is the time we are to carry that gospel wherever we go. And you, if you're a Christian, if you're saved and you've got the Holy Ghost living inside of you, you have the anointing upon you to do the things that God has called you to do, to stand up for what is right, to live for Jesus in a lost and dying world, to not compromise, to say, I'm not gonna lie. I'm not going to do these things. You have that inside of you, that gifting, that anointing to stand up and to live for Jesus and be a light into this world. That's what he's called us to do. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. I'm anointed to bring hope. Promise fulfilled in a moment, we're still watching it unfold. 
There's good news for the captive, a proclamation for every soul. This liberty is for the broken, an invitation to be made whole. Listen for the free man singing, he's delivered me. Look up for the woman shouting, his garment made me clean. Listen up for the seasons changing, he's rebuilding everything. Listen for the people shouting, this is Jubilee. upon me I'm anointed to bring hope the promise fulfilled in a moment we're still watching it unfold there's good news for the captive a proclamation for every soul this liberty is for the broken an invitation to be made changing he's rebuilding everything listen for the people shouting this is jubilee the one 
woman shouting his garment made me clean listen up for the seasons changing he's rebuilding everything listen for the people shouting this is jubilee come on this is our jubilee hallelujah he's rebuilding we watched him rebuild our church he's rebuilding lives and we trust him to continue on he's our fourth man in the fire right he's with us he's with us in the lion's den he's with us wherever we go we trust him blessed assurance and jesus is mine and he's been my fourth man in the fire time after time and born of his spirit and washed in his blood and what he did for me on calvary is more than enough i trust in god my savior the one who will fail I trust in God my Savior the one who will never fail he will never fail perfect submission all is at rest I know the author of tomorrow has ordered my steps so this is my story and this is my song I'm praising my risen King and Savior all the day long on, I trust in God my Savior the one who will never fail he will never fail I trust in God my Savior the one And he heard, and he answered. I saw the Lord, and he heard, and he answered. I saw the Lord, and he heard, and he answered. That's why I trust him. That's why I trust him. I saw the Lord, and he heard, and he answered. I saw the Lord, and he heard, and he answered. I saw the Lord, and he heard. And he answered, that's why I trust him, that's why I trust him. I saw the Lord, and he heard, and he answered. I saw the Lord, and he heard, and he answered. I saw the Lord, and he heard, and he answered. That's why I trust him, that's why I trust in God. My Savior, the one who will never fail, he will never fail. I trust.
trust in God, my Savior, the one who will never fail. He will never fail. I trust in God. your God never fails. Oh, hallelujah. I may be seated. We're excited about what God is doing. I, I can't believe that our 100th year celebration is almost on us. We're going to have such a good time. Uh, tonight, I don't know if uh, I was able to watch a, a few of the uh, performances that their kids did. Uh, we had a funeral yesterday, Miss. Uh, Lois's home going. Uh, I want to thank all of the ladies and men that helped serve. Uh, all of the staff was in uh, fine arts helping all of the stuff there, and so uh, we, we needed extra help, and we got it. Thank y'all. Uh, we took care of the family and loved on them, and, you know, that's what, that's what we want to do. Uh, heaven is, is, is a, a joyful blessing. Amen? It is a reward that we get when we live right, we get to go to heaven. If sometimes, you know, we allow the overshadowing of people going ahead of us to rob us of the joy for them. And so, Miss Lois, we celebrated her, uh, her uh, kids, grandkids, great-grandkids, and great-great-grandkids. And so it was a joyous time. If you'll open up your Bibles to Luke, the fourth chapter, we're going to read there. Uh, as we're talking about Jubilee, I, I felt like I needed to, to kind of lay out what Jubilee was because I don't know, if you don't study it out, you don't look it up, it's hard to really understand the joy, the power, the anointing, what God intended. So we're going to read this and I'm, I'm going to go into a pretty good explanation. I won't be able to read all of my scriptures. We're going to make sure that how many of y'all, if you have the church app, uh, you can go. I'm going to make sure that they put all the scriptures where you can get them because there's lots and lots of scriptures, Old Testament and New Testament. So uh, when, I, when all of my leaders uh, hear this, they'll say, hey, wait a minute, Pastor Fake gave us more work to do. But it, won't be, it should be just pretty easy. So in Luke uh, chapter 4, Jesus, Jesus is just coming back. From 40 days in the wilderness being tempted by the devil. I mean, he was just put on it. If you go back and read, you see that he, uh, he fasted for 40 days. He's in the wilderness. The enemy is tempting him on every point. Everything Satan can do, he's coming against Jesus. And Jesus won. He not one time did he sin or give in to the temptation. Not one time did he yield to, to Satan and, and to his attack. But instead, he won victory. He, he rebuked the devil, put him back in his place, told the devil that, that he wouldn't get to bow down to him. He didn't need him to give him anything, that he was going to go take it. Amen? And so he, he leaves from there, and, and he makes his way back to Nazareth, which is where he grew up. And he goes into the synagogue, and they, they, they allow him to read. And so Jesus asked them to give him the scroll of Isaiah. And so it says in verse 17, And they delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when it had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book, and he gave it again to the ministers, and sat down. And the eyes of them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say unto them, This day 
Is this scripture fulfilled in your ears? Father, I ask that you would allow me to speak the word that you have given me. Lord God, that you would touch the heart of those that are here, that they would receive, Lord God, today, and that, Lord God, they would allow themselves to enter into that place that you have for them. Father, we give you the glory and the honor and the praise. In Jesus' name, amen. So the, the audience there understood what Jesus was saying. You know, context matters, right? See, people can say things to you and, and you have no idea what context it comes in. It's hard really to, to understand. There are times when this generation, you know, they, they, they say stuff like, you know, uh, one of them is, man, Pastor, that was slapping. And I thought, huh? Or my niece would tell, man, that's, that was dri- you dripping. <laughs> what? And, and I looked around, I was like, well, I'm not. I don't think I'm dripping. You know, I don't have the context that the young people do for, for their terminology, right? Every generation has it. You know, we had it. My parents used to say, that ain't how you say what we're talking about, you know. Y'all need to learn to define words. <laughs> uh, I find myself challenging my dad, you know. One of these generations, you need to know the words you're using don't mean what you're saying. And so, so context, so in the context of understanding, everyone in the room when Jesus read that and said, this day is this fulfilled in your hearing, that was talking about the Messiah. It was talking about the Savior that was coming to earth to, to bring deliverance to the bondage, to bring healing to the broken. And so he understood, they understood, and they got mad. Because they were looking in that time for a delivering king to come in and to set all of them free from the bondage that Rome had on them. They wanted the the Messiah to come in and and to destroy the, the stronghold of hell that had held them back. They wanted a restoration of David and Solomon's kingdom where everything was wonderful and they ruled the world. But we understand as we read the Bible, as we as we have the benefit of being on this side of that is that there had to be a suffering savior there had to be a sacrifice for the sin of humanity before god could bring the conquering savior he had to first bring the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the earth and so jesus presents that to them but in verse 19 it says to preach the acceptable year of the lord that terminology is talking about the year of jubilee and that's what we're talking the celebration of the year of jubilee but to understand that you have to go back into the law which is what i'm not going to go through all the different scriptures i will tell you that you can look into leviticus 25 23 27 chapters isaiah 61 luke uh ezekiel 7 Jeremiah 34. These, we'll, we'll get those scriptures put on the, on the uh, website so y'all can find them. There's just too many. If I went through them, I'd never get finished. I have a hard time getting finished anyway. And so, so I want us to, to follow. So, so when, when God created the heavens and the earth, right, what did he do on the seventh day? He rested. He took a sabbatical, a, a, a day of rest, after he created, not because he was tired, but because he wanted to show us a principle for our lives. And so once that happened, and then Israel went into captivity, and they were in the wilderness for 40 years, what did God do for them? He brought them manna from heaven and fed them, and he said, I want y'all to go every day and pick up enough for the day, right? Except on the sixth day. On the sixth day, I want you to go in and I want you to collect enough for two days. Because on the seventh day, I want you to rest. No one does any work. You just rest. And some of them didn't listen. Some of them went anyway. Uh, Some of them got a whole lot and they saved it. They were going to have extra the next day. The Bible says that it stunk and and, and turned and worms all in it. And then, then some went out on the Sabbath day and picked it anyway, and God, God had them killed. 
God's principles and His law and His commandments and His desire are not negotiable. I don't know if y'all know that. Do y'all, y'all know that His commandments aren't negotiable? They're not the ten suggestions. Right? God's commandments are non-negotiable, and if we don't obey Him and we don't follow Him and we don't do what He wants us to do, we put ourselves under a curse and, and under a situation where we can't find peace and freedom and joy and happiness because we're being disobedient to God. And so He lays these things out, and, and He's trying to teach us about this sabbatical, about this day of rest, about this time of trust. And, and so when Israel comes into the promised land, He sets forth the the years, the sabbatical years, that every seven years there was a sabbatical. They had, they had work and planting and, and everything for six years. In the seventh year, they couldn't plow the ground. They couldn't work their uh, vines. They, they had to live off what they collected in the sixth year through the seventh year and until the harvest of the eighth year. And God did that because he said, I want y'all to trust me that it's not your hard work and it's not your ability to grow something, but I'm going to cause the ground to be blessed for your sake, but I'm going to allow you to have this time of rest. Now you say, well, yeah, but why would God do that? Because he understood us. God knows how hard-headed we are. And we won't rest when we need to rest. We'll just push right through. But he also knew there would be those people that would put demands on the people working for them and wouldn't give them a day off. How many of y'all know that's, that, that, that's true? That there are people that they'll say, well, I don't, you don't need a day off. I need this production, and I need you to work for me, and I need you to be out doing this, and we don't get the rest. And God understands that when we don't allow ourselves to have a rest in our minds and in our hearts, we wind up getting tired and weary. And when we get tired and weary, we make really bad decisions. Have y'all noticed that? You know, when, when, you're, when you're tired and you're wore out, it's not the time to make life decisions. You ought to find a place to rest your mind so that you can think more clearly. Anybody ever been there? Just, just, just making some bad choices because you're tired, you're wore out, can't sleep at night, can't sleep in the daytime. And I'm just frustrated and, I'm, and, and everybody's telling me all this junk and, and, and I can't make head nor tails out of it. And instead of pulling ourselves aside and waiting upon God and resting, being still. Sometimes you just need to be still and quiet. Thought I'd put that in there. So that God can, can refresh you and speak to you. And so every sixth year... They would have a, uh, the harvest, and they would collect their harvest, and they would store them up. And then the seventh year, they had to let the land rest. It wasn't just for people. It was also for the land and the animals to give them a time to rest, to rebuild themselves, to, to be able to move on. But God always allowed there to be enough crops and enough product in the sixth year to carry them through. But they had to trust him. And put them up. You know, many of y'all probably have gardens or grew up around gardens. And in certain times of the year, you grow certain things. And so you learn to preserve them. You learn how to can stuff because in the months that came after you were able to have fresh stuff, you couldn't have it anymore. And so we learn how to put stuff up because we wanted to have some fresh tomatoes in the middle of winter. You know, we wanted to be able to have uh, the, the uh, corn, and we wanted to be able to have fresh meat. And, and how can you have that? They didn't have refrigerators. They had to learn how to preserve the meat so that it would last them, and they could, they could not go hungry because they, they weren't able to get what they needed in that moment. They learned how to do that. And so what God is showing Israel is he's showing them how to trust him, to take what he gave them and to put it up and not be wasteful, not to throw stuff away, not to just go past and keep going and keep going and keep going. Because then when you get yourself overextended, what happens? Now you can't rest because now you have to do work all the time and you can never stop because you can't pay your bills if you don't. 
because we overextend ourselves. And we do that, and Israel did that, and humanity has done that. And so God said, no, I'm going to make you have a rest. I'm going to make you have a time that you can rest. And so every seven sabbatical years is 49 years, right? So at that 49th year, you had a sabbatical. And then going into the 50th year was Jubilee, which is another Sabbath. So what God said is now on the 50th anniversary, we're not just going to make you have rest, but something else is going to happen. And so for the, for the Jewish people, there were some that had money, some that didn't, just like we are today. And so what they would do is people that didn't have a lot of money, but they had land that was given to them by God. See, when Moses, remember when they came into the promised land, they divided the land up among tribes and then people, families in the tribe. And the families never lost their land. Now, they could rent their land out for a process. And so here's how it worked. If I was going to lease land from my father-in-law, and I said, I want to lease, lease this land from you, and he said, well, this land produces about $500 a year worth of crops. Okay, so how would I determine how much I had to pay him was based upon how long till the year of Jubilee. Now, if we were just starting and there was, you know, year one, I would have to pay him a lot more money than if I was in year 48. Because he only is going to allow me to use it for those two years. There was the year of Jubilee was a year when everything would stop. People also sold themselves as bond slaves, bond servants. Now we talk about that and there were slaves that they, they served whoever gave them the money they needed. And that money that they would give them would help their families and, and they would work and they had to work for them, stay where they were and take care of their stuff. But they, they had rules on how they could treat them, what they could and couldn't do. It wasn't uh, a slavery where they had no choice. It wasn't perpetual. It came to an end. It would come to an end on the year of Jubilee. And so Jesus is telling the people that are there that, that the Spirit of the Lord was upon him to preach the gospel, the good news to the poor. What is the good news? The good news is the time of struggle is about over. The good news was that they were coming into this time when there was about to be a release back to everybody that had been struggling. And we find that in the Word of God, that in Adam and Eve, they, they sinned in the garden and they lost the right for us to be able to have the relationship with God He intended when He created us. Because Adam and Eve sold themselves unto sin and it was passed upon every generation from Jesus, from, from Adam and Eve to Jesus because sin has ruled and reigned. The Bible says that sin ruled from Adam all the way up to Jesus. And Jesus, when he came, he came to break that stronghold that we lost the things in the garden. And man lost their dominion. We lost our rights. We lost our health. We lost our peace. In the Garden of Eden, all those things were taken and lost to us because death entered into humanity because of Adam and Eve. We find this process that is passed on that what God intended for us to have was lost. And so he brought us through a process of teaching us and showing us that what sin, the, the, the horror of sin, it's not just, well, God, I messed up today, forgive me. But it's to understand that sin equals death. That something had to die for them in order to just keep the, the punishment back so that, that they weren't going to be judged from year to year. So what God did is he initiated a sacrificial system so that Israel would be able to go before the high priest and, and get sacrifices for the stuff that they had done wrong. And they had to present something that, that had to die because of them. And so it's important that we understand that as God was setting those things in order, he was trying to show not just the, the depravity of sin, but, but the, the 
strength of the blood and the sacrifice and, and, and it had to be a pure sacrifice. So every year on the Day of Atonement, the high priest would have to go into the Holy of Holies. Now, the high priest would do sacrifices for Israel all through the year, but on the Day of Atonement, the first thing the high priest had to do was make a sacrifice for himself. He had to make sure he was okay. Because, see, they would put the robes on and, and they'd go into the Holy of Holies where, where the Ark of the Covenant was. And nobody could just walk in there because the presence of God was there and they would die because they were sinful. And sin can't live in the presence of God. So they would, they would put on this big robe and at the bottom of the robe around the, the, uh, the hem of it was little bells that, that would ring as they walked, you know. And they would tie a rope around the waist of the high priest and he would go into the holy of holies and and he would be preparing the the sacrifice and the things he needed to do and they had the bells in case he quit moving because they couldn't go in there and get him so they tied a rope around him i mean it was it was such a a serious and such a so, uh uh, a, a moment that the entire nation of Israel would wait on the Day of Atonement outside of the tabernacle, outside of the temple, waiting for the high priest to come out so they would know whether or not the sacrifice had covered their sins up for another year. It didn't wash them away. It only covered them up so that judgment could be pushed back. And the priest would move around. I, I don't know if they ever had any clowns uh, as high priests who maybe got real steel just to see what they would do. You know? And I'm sure that they, they kind of tug on the rope just a little bit, see, see if he moves. You know? And he had to pull it back, say, leave me alone, I ain't done. But, but they, would, they would come out of the, uh, of the uh, Holy of Holies and, and all of the other priests that were in the holy place would see it, and they would be excited and joyful. And then they would walk out into the common place so that everybody could see that, that God accepted the sacrifice and that sin's judgment was rolled back another year. And they would know, hey, we're going to be okay for another year as a nation. We're going to be okay. And that was a process that happened for so long that, that from the time that Adam and Eve sinned, that, that God clothed them with animal skin, which means an animal had to die so he could clothe them. The first blood sacrifice, God intervened on man's behalf so that man wouldn't have to die physically in that moment, though we died spiritually. But there was one coming. Jesus declares on this day in the in the hearing of these people that I'm here to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. I am here to tell you that there is a jubilee, that there is a returning of all that was lost. Now, now they always understood the physical aspects of that, but Jesus is about to bring the spiritual aspects of everything that was lost because of Adam and Eve was about to be restored through Jesus. Isn't that cool? And so we see here that on the Day of Atonement, in the year of Jubilee, they would come out, and the priests always had their horns, right? Now, I'm not, I'm not a, a king horn blower, but, but they always had their horns. But on the Day of Atonement in Jubilee, the year of Jubilee always started after the atonement was made. After the high priest came out, and, and he would walk out and, and he would stand there and they would see that God accepted. And then the priest would stand back. And they would blow that trumpet. When they blew the trumpet, Israel would shout because Jubilee has begun. And everybody got to go back to what was theirs. They may have been somebody I had to rent my land to because I owed money and couldn't pay it. But on the year of Jubilee, when that trumpet blew, those people had to get out of my stuff. They had to get out of my house. They had to let go of my belongings because they all came back to me. Isn't that really cool? Think about that. Can you imagine? 50 years has passed, and now you get to go back and have what is yours. 
You get to go back and get what belonged to you. And, and, and the Israel understood this. So Jesus is saying to them, I am the Messiah. I am the ruler. I'm coming and I'm going to bring a restoration to you of what was lost. He wasn't talking about their land. He wasn't talking about their possessions. He was talking about their soul. He was talking about their right of relationship with God Almighty. He was talking about a time of re-entering into that covenant where they could spend time and talk to God, where they could live in a place without fear, where they no longer had to allow death to rule because Jesus won the victory over hell and death. Now, as we see that Jesus is crucified and, and it's on Passover, and, and he, he dies, and he, he goes into the ground. Oh, but let me tell you something. He was that sacrificial lamb, and he didn't just let any high priest go into the Holy of Holies, but he took his own blood. Oh, come on, y'all. He didn't take the blood of bulls and goats. It, it wasn't that sacrifice that was going to cover it up just a little bit longer. It was the blood that was going to wash away the very essence of every sin ever committed by any man. Y'all, Jesus is our jubilee. When he came back, can you imagine as he walked out of the Holy of Holies that is in heaven? I believe there were angels. They blew the trumpets because the jubilee was there. The lost humanity was restored because of Jesus. No longer, no longer did man have to go through the sacrifice system, through the, the hope that they would be forgiven. But now, because of what Jesus did, because he overcame sin and hell and death, that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That perpetual jubilee belongs to you and me. That God wants to restore what the devil stole from me in the Garden of Eden. He wants to restore my health. He wants to restore my peace. He wants to restore our relationship. God wants to spend time with you. And he made it possible through Jesus. See, when we talk about the year of Jubilee, that's why I get excited. Because I understand that it is a restoration to me. Now, the devil doesn't want you to walk in that. The devil wants you to believe that you just got to be sick and miserable till you die and go to heaven. But that's not what Jubilee is about. That's not what Jesus paid his life on Calvary, that he died on that cross. He was that lamb, it says in Revelation, slain from the foundation of the earth. Before God created anything, he knew we were going to mess up. Anybody here ever beat yourself up because you mess up? Can I tell you, God knew before you were born you were going to mess up. And he died for you anyway. Oh, y'all, he loves you. He loves you so much that Jesus came and he suffered and he died, even though he knew he was dying for imperfect people who wasn't just going to mess up once. Oh, I wish after I got saved I could say, once I got saved, I never messed up. But if you read my book, you know that's a lie. That just ain't true. I did mess up and, and I had to repent and I had to find a place before God. And the devil uses that against me and uses that against me to make me feel unworthy to be used by him. Unworthy to be anything more than, than just somebody sitting in the back hoping that God's mercy would eventually get me into heaven. But Jubilee wasn't so that I could just barely get there. It was a release of everything that belonged to me has been released to me. And I, all I have to do is take it. See, the law of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. I am no longer bound under the law of sin and death because the law of life in Christ Jesus, when Jesus rose from the grave and he threw the, his own blood on that judgment seat, it covered up my sins and washed them away, made them no longer there. So now when I go before God, old things are passed away. Behold, all things things are become brand new. I'm a new creature in Christ Jesus. I'm no longer what I was. 
I bring myself into this place and I see as, as God begins to show me the restoration of who I am. He didn't show it all to me at one moment. There's been many times in my life when God's had to remind me, why are you living this way? Why are you living in a beat up situation? Why are you letting the devil hold you down when I picked you up? Why are you allowing the enemy to rob your finances when I promise to bless your finances? Why are you allowing the devil to keep fear in your heart when you know I didn't give you a spirit of fear? But the enemy is continually attacking and coming against, even more so now as he knows his time is short. His judgment is about to come. Oh, hallelujah. That's, that's one of the things that though I, I labor in wanting to be here to tell lost people about Jesus. I also want to be released to be in the presence of God because I know that for me to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. I know that because the blood of Jesus has made me clean. The jubilee of my life happened when Jesus came out of that heavenly temple. You know, the Bible says he, he said to Mary and them, don't touch me. I, I still have to go to heaven. I still have to go to the Holy of Holies. I, I've not yet been there. He had to bring his blood, that blood, that perfect blood into the heavenly uh, tabernacle. We know if we read in Revelations and we read the word of God that the earthly tabernacle was nothing more than a shadow or type of what was already in heaven. We see in heaven in revelations there's a temple that's there it was the model that they built the one on earth with jesus walks into that temple he walks into that holy of holies he walks into that place and he takes his blood and he sprinkles it on that on that uh, judgment seat so that it turned in to a mercy seat so now when i go to god he doesn't see my sin he doesn't see my shortcomings he doesn't see my failures he looks at me and sees jesus he looks at me and he sees that blood that was shed so that I could be whole. And that's why, you know what, I don't plan to be dumb and do dumb stuff. Sometimes dumb stuff just happens. Oh, come on, somebody. Some of y'all ain't amen and ought to be. But I know that I have an advocate, I have an intercessor, I have, I have a Savior that stands at the right hand of the Father saying, yeah, yeah I was dumb, but you know, he... He's covered because he's going to repent. See, I, 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 don't, I don't become arrogant in my walk with God, but, but I come to that place. I understand that my jubilee is not based upon me and my goodness. And, and I want you to know that all your good works aren't going to provide you a better place to stand in front of God and say, now God, I was really good. I demand that you take care of me. We don't do that. We come humbly before the throne room of grace. And we let our petitions be made known. But we have a confidence because of what Jesus did. Because when he walked out of that holy of holies, the angels blew those trumpets and the, the jubilee for humanity began in that moment. And it will not end. We've been set free and we have been raised up. God has done everything that he said he was going to do. And we have to understand that the power of God dwells inside of of his church. I'm not talking about this building. I'm talking about you. The power of God dwells inside of his church. I am his church and he dwells here inside of me. When I forget that is when the devil messes me up. You know what I'm talking about? When you're in the middle of the struggle and you're just trying to keep everything above water and not drown, you forget that he's the one that can help you walk on top of it. He can, he can lift you up so that you don't have to be under the waves of the garbage that's in your life. 
but that you can walk on top of it and be set free and walk in that victory. That's what this restoration, he, he wants us to be restored, to be restored in my mind that, that I'm no longer uh, at, at a rage with myself, that all these, these attacks against my mind that, that tell me that I'm not good enough or tells me that I'll never be able to survive. Yeah, I don't know about y'all, but the devil always wants me to believe that whatever storm's coming up is going to make me sink. He wants me to believe that, that every attack that's happening right now is going to be beyond my ability to be able to handle it. He's, he attacks my mind and he tries to get me to, to think all the negative thoughts. He, he's always trying to make me look at this bad and this bad and this bad and think to myself, there's no way I'm going to be anything and I, I'm never going to change. and I'm never going to be any better than I've always been. Let me tell you something. Those are lies that come from the pit of hell. It doesn't matter if you fail a thousand times. You just keep getting up and you keep declaring the Word of God over your life and you're going to win. You're not going to lose. God will give you the ability. Don't let your mind... Be overwhelmed by the lies of hell. My mind, I have the mind of Christ. It don't matter what it looks like sometimes. I'm still going to declare. I'm still going to hold. I'm still going to press in that God has me. Amen. I'm going to be careful to wash my mind with the water of the Word of God. When the enemy tells me I'll never change, I'm going to declare that I'm a new creature. That old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become brand new. My mind is not what it used to be. My heart is not what it used to be. I don't have to allow sickness to rob me all the time. There are going to be times we're going to go through some stuff. That's just the world we live in. There are consequences to some of the stuff that you have done in your life. Right? Some of us, we, our hands get sore when the weather changes. You know, if I had to punch walls, people, and trees, I probably wouldn't have as much pain in my hands. It didn't help. If, if you're going to eat donuts and sugar candies and and, 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 and all kinds of sweets, and you have issues with blood sugar, don't you get mad at God. Take the donut out your mouth. You know? I mean, there are some consequences. Some of it ain't your fault. You was born in South Louisiana, that ain't your fault. <laughs> Best food in the world. But you know what? There's things we can help and there's things we can't help. All those things don't matter. I put myself in God's hands. If I die tomorrow, if I die 20 years from now, either way, I'm in God's hands. And if I die, the devil don't win. I do because I get to go be with Jesus. Right? So I have to understand that I'm not going to allow the enemy to come in and to rob me. I'm not going to allow the enemy to, to, to rob my family from me. My kids are serving God. They're going to serve God. And they're going to continue better and better serving God. Why? Because I've hung on to the promise that me and my household will serve God. It's been, a, it's been an up and down. It's been a struggle. That's right. Y'all give God a hand clap because God does that. I've watched God bring whole families back to Him. I, I saw my dad and his salvation reached every one of his brothers and sisters because he was the worst of the group. He really was. I, I, I'm, I don't just say that. I got family that can verify for you. My dad, was the, he was the worst of the kids. And my dad, because he had such a mighty calling in his life, the devil did everything he could do to destroy him. But God kept him. Because my granny Thompson prayed for him every night. She believed God that he was going to serve God. And when my mama went to her and said, are you surprised that, that Pat's serving God? She never missed a beat. She said, absolutely not. She said, I've been praying for him. I knew he was going to come serve God. 
Never, never crossed her mind that God wouldn't do what he said he was going to do. Why? Because she had understood that God promised her that. See, it is the, the year of release, and, and that's where we perpetually live in. You don't have to wait. We're celebrating the Bayou Blues 50th year of, of, of Jubilee, and I believe God spoke to me that there's some things he's releasing to our church and to us, and, and I'm excited about that. But we live in a perpetual place of restoration from what was lost, restoration from what sin did to us so that God can give us back those things that were lost to us. You may think that because you made some bad choices that now you're just stuck with those consequences, but if you will give it to God, God has a way of if it doesn't work out the way you thought it should, He'll work it out better than you can imagine. Because He's smarter than you. In case you didn't know. But the year of jubilee, the the year of release, the the year to walk in your victory, Janet, you can come. I believe that that God is, is stirring in our hearts. You know what he's waiting on? He's waiting on you to take hold of what he promised you. Stop being a beggar. Start being a champion. Stop sitting back wishing your life could be different and begin to declare the Word of God over your life. When you declare God's Word over your life, it doesn't change anything except you. His Word's already there. You have to take it for you. It's not enough for me to believe it's for me. If you can't believe it's for you, you won't walk in it. If you can't believe that God wants to give you peace and strength and joy, you'll never walk in it. You'll walk around beat up and broken. And when someone says, why, you ought to smile. Say, you don't know me. (laughs) Oh, okay. But you know what? We think that because we are honest. I, I, I mean, I wasn't making up how bad I was. I know all the junk I did. I know all the stuff I pulled. And I don't deserve God's grace in my life. I guess that's why it's called grace, huh? It's unearned favor. You don't deserve it. None of us do. But when Jesus came out of the heavenly temple, and it was finished, he paid the last bit, took the blood and sprinkled it, and restoration to humanity. The plan that God had from the foundation of the earth spoke it the first time in the Garden of Eden. And it was fulfilled there on Calvary. His Son, His only begotten Son, died for man's sin. And as one man, the first Adam, lost all of that for us, Jesus, the second Adam, restored it all back to us. And I believe that God is waiting on you to say to yourself, I'm not going to live beneath myself anymore. I'm not going to walk in fear. I'm not going to walk in pain. I'm not going to walk with a heartache. I'm letting God heal my past. I'm going to let God heal my wounds. I'm going to let God take away the pain and the strength of my past and give me my future. I believe that. I believe that we just need to hear the, the, the sounds of the heavenly trumpet. Every eye closed, every head bowed. Father, as we're here today, Lord God, I believe that there are those that, that are struggling with fear, those that are struggling with their past, those that are struggling with their choices. And God, they, they feel like they're ensnared and they're entrapped, that they've been sold to Satan. They've been sold to, to the enemy by the choices. But God, as I blow this trumpet in just a minute, that Lord God, you will release them, Lord God, to have what you promised them. Y'all stand to your feet and and just begin to pray and begin to hold yourself to God. If if you're you're battling with anything in your life, just raise your hands to God right now. We're we're just going to go into prayer right now. And I'm going to get ready. I'm going to blow this trumpet. And when I blow this trumpet, I want you to receive by faith the end of what you're struggling with. Whatever you've been believing God for, when I blow the trumpet, know that that God's releasing that into you, that the year of jubilee for you is begun right now, just in the name of Jesus.
Just let God just release that. Just give it to Him right now in, by faith. God, in the name of Jesus, we release to You all fear. We release our past. We release those things that rob us. God, we give it all to You right now in the name of Jesus. Lord, let their year of jubilee begin right now as God, You restore unto them everything that has been lost we ask it right now in jesus name if my prayer team would make the way to the front we want to pray for you if you have need of somebody to agree with you in prayer i want you to just make your way up one of our prayer team will take care of you as she plays you make your way up listen for the free man singing he's delivered for the woman shout